Beautiful Come On Community Center, and thank you for joining us for our home ownership workshop. Today, it will be presented by the City of Fort Worth Neighborhood Services Department. My name is Shauna Shepard, and I'm here to represent Neighborhood Services. But we also have the pleasure to partner with Tarrant Appraisal District today as well. And later on, Jeff Law, the Chief Appraiser, will be here um, to discuss more what Tad has to offer. So he is the man in town. So y'all are here for a treat. <laughs> so for what the City of Fort Worth Neighborhood Services Department, um, our mission is building strong neighborhoods by empowering residents with housing, community development, and social services. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about some of those various services that we have. So here's just a little snapshot of some of the services that we provide from community action partners, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, to our Lead Safe program, our Home Buyer Assistance program, Priority Repair. I'm going to go off just a little bit. Um, we want to focus on the Home Buyer, but I have to tell you a little bit about some of the other resources that we have. And if, through some of the resources, we help pay for short-term certifications um, for our residents, whether it's cosmetology, HVAC, equipment operators. We also provide free tax services. If you make less than $60,000, um, your taxes are free. Our employees are IRS certified, so they use the same services as IRS. And I know it's tax season, so I had to make sure I do that plug there. Okay, so now back to housing related programs. So our community action partners is a part of the City of Fort Worth Neighborhood Services Department. Our goal is to assist residents in living an independent, self-sufficient life by providing an opportunity for professional skills, training, education, and supportive services. We also assist the elderly, the disabled and households with children under five. And of course, we have special services for our veterans. And we'll go next. Now let's talk about utility assistance. We have a comprehensive energy assistance program. And within that program, we have sub programs underneath that. We have the utility assistance program where we assist with up to six utility payments per year. And we know how Texas is with the up and down bipolar weather. Sometimes it's $60 a month, and then next thing you know, it's $300 the next month. So if there's, I know we have different eligibility requirements, but if you need assistance with utility, please utilize the service. It's available to you. We also have the low income housing water assistance program and i'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide and then we have the household crisis program and it assists families that have been disconnected or due to a weather crisis we know in um especially in the fort worth area the weather crisis we had i believe it was last year it was just it's, i've never seen anything like it that was a particular program we would have helped residents with, especially with the bursted pipes. And I'll talk about a couple of those programs here later on. And then we also have the household crisis repair program where we focus on priority groups in the general population. And usually when we're talking about priority groups, it is usually our seniors and disabled because they are the most vulnerable population fair weather crises. And of course, they must meet eligibility criteria. And I'll move on to the low income household water assistance program. This program is new. And the goal of the program is to assist low income households, particularly with, with the lowest incomes that pay a high proportion of income for drinking water and wastewater services. If you are someone you know, can help with their water bill. I invite you out February 15th at the Family Action Center. We have some brochures in the back, so don't worry about having to write all this down. But I encourage you to come. If it doesn't help you, share with a community member, 
a church member, or a neighbor. Because sometimes with our water bills, it could be an issue with leaking. It could be an issue with old pipes. And our water department also provides programs to help you learn about your irrigation system, um, water bills, all of yeah, check it out on the water department site. They will help you uh, figure out what's going on with the leak. So your water bill isn't 71 times and it's 300 another because that has actually happened. And it, it can be just a small leak in the toilet. And one of the programs for the water department is called a smart flush program. And they do have eligibility requirements, but they can replace your toilet. Okay. All right. Next. So how can you access some of the community action partner services? I know you were thinking that. So you can apply online. You can upload your required documents, and you can also see a representative in person at our community centers. And today I have a representative, so after the class, if you have questions regarding the community action partners, I have a colleague here with me that is willing to assist you. And Como Community Center also has a CAP office that will be willing to assist you. Now let's talk about the housing program services that our department has through priority repair, lead safe, weatherization, and then our home buyer assistance program. So our priority repair program, it assists with electrical system failures, roof repairs, air conditioning, subflooring, and plumbing issues. And the good news is not too long ago, our budget range from $5,000 to $20,000 per household. So if you have different plumbing issues, and of course each program has eligibility criteria, then let me know, okay? And we'll help fill out an application and get you to the representative of one of my colleagues that can assist you further. The Lead Safe Program. The Lead Safe Program are really for houses that were built before 1978. And it does target the elderly and the children. And the reason why, because lead, you can't see, right? So how can we help remove that to have a health and safe home? So if your house was built before 1978, you can have an assessment to see if there's lead in your home. And we can have a representative go out there, ensure you meet the eligibility criteria, and get that done for you. Next is the weatherization assistance program. The purpose of this program is to reduce the energy costs for income families. Again, particularly those that are elderly, people with disabilities and children. And some of the examples of the repairs that are done is the attic, the wall, floor installation, um, caulking, weather stripping and duct sealing. And the importance of that is the window is cracked and it's 30 degrees and you have the heat on 80 degrees, it don't matter, right? Cause it's still cold. So these are some of the programs that are available to you. Just wanna keep that in mind. And then they also help with the health and safety aspects of the appliances, checking for the gas stoves, water heater and proper ventilation. Next is the home buyer assistance program. They provide mortgage assistance for first time home buyers that have not owned a home in the last three years. Sounds weird, right? Well, first time home buyer, but you cannot have owned a home in the last three years. So if you owned a home in 2000, you have, you've been written for the last 20 years, you will be eligible for this program. So it provides up to $20,000 for homes in Fort Worth. You can either use the full 20,000 or use up to 3% of the loan amount. In order to be eligible, you have to be in Fort Worth. You have to be in the home, right? So if you're a realtor or you own multiple properties, one home, okay, where you actually live. And of course, there's additional eligibility requirements. If anyone has an interest in the priority repair program I talked about, lead safe or the weatherization program please get with me afterwards because i have application packets and i didn't want to overwhelm you with the information in the back so just get with me afterwards and i'll make sure you get the information that you need 
And lastly, how do you apply for the housing program services? I have included the phone number and the online um, application process. So if you're interested, go ahead and take a snapshot. Let me get out your picture. <laughs> And they will be more than glad to assist you. We'll click next. Next, I have the pleasure of welcoming the. Oh, you need to go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Will this slideshow be available anywhere after this meeting? I can certainly send that to you. Does that help? You? Okay. So I'll make sure um, we'll have a sign in sheet at the end. So before you leave, please make sure you include your information. I won't sell it. I won't give it to anybody else. I will honor the class today. All right. And I'm going through this pretty quickly because as City of Fort Worth, we just want to provide you the services that we have, but be more than glad to answer questions after the workshop is over today. All right. So next, I have the pleasure of introducing our representative for the day for Ter Appraisal District, Jeff Law, the Chief Appraiser. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, and uh, maybe answer your question with regards to will the slides be available. We actually are live streaming this, I believe. Yes, sir. We're live streaming this right now on Facebook to the Tarrant Appraisal District's Facebook page. And if the quality turns out well, we'll, we'll probably upload it to the Tarrant Appraisal District's YouTube page. And so you could go back and watch it again. Or if you have friends that uh, didn't get to participate tonight, they could go back and watch it again. Uh, this is... I'm, I'm very happy to partner with the City of Fort Worth and Shauna. This is actually our second time to do this particular presentation. We did it yesterday uh, at another community center, and then we're doing it tonight. And I uh, have to say our video from yesterday didn't turn out as well. <laughs> so we're, we're not going to upload it because it was, there were some out-of-focus moments. But I really do appreciate the fact that you all showed up tonight. And uh, Shauna has given you some really good information with regards to how to save some money with utilities and, and home repairs and things like that. The appraisal district deals with property taxes. So I'm gonna give you some ideas and some tips and tricks on maybe how you can save on your property tax side, okay? So let me uh, grab my little notes here. I, I don't get, I get this. I'm just gonna keep up with her, her PowerPoint and my notes. Uh, let's start out a little bit by talking about the history of the parent appraisal district, okay? Every county in the state of Texas has an appraisal district. There's 254 appraisal districts. Technically, there's 253 because if you go up to Amarillo, you ever been to Amarillo? Amarillo sits right in the middle of Potter County and Randall County. So they decided in their infinite wisdom that, that those two counties would just join one appraisal district. So there's 253 appraisal districts in Texas. Appraisal districts were created in 1979 in the legislature back then where they wanted to separate the duties of the appraisal process from the duties of tax collection. In the past that the tax assessor collector would work for the city the county the school and they would do both the appraisal and they would also determine the revenue and they would also determine the tax rate so the legislature decided to split these part, these items up where you'd have one element that would deal with revenue and taxation and then you'd have the appraisal districts that would deal with value value and exemptions so the idea was to, to take politics out of it and try to have a, one entity that set value and the other entity that collected revenue Property tax code governs everything that we do. There's, there's prop, the property tax code, the laws, basically, are the ones that uh, we have to follow and when we're doing what we do. Our responsibilities, next slide. Uh, our general responsibilities are that we appraise property. We're, basically, that's what we are. We're appraisers. And, and our job by the legislature is to go out and appraise properties at what we call 100% market value. And that basically means market value, the definition is the price at which the property would sell if it was put on the market around January the 1st, what it would sell for on, on that January 1st. Our appraisal date is January 1st. So we're always looking to see what is your house worth on January the 1st. Okay, so January the 1st of 2022, the value that we set, the value that we wind up certifying in July, that's the value that will be used to determine how much property tax you have to pay. Then we do it all again on January the 1st of 2023. And right now the market has been trending up. The market's been going up, quite frankly, it's been going up more than I've ever seen it in the 30 some odd years that I've been doing this. Okay, we're, we're at a really unprecedented market for the last several years. 
The other thing that we do also is we administer property tax exemptions. Now, this is the part where you can save some money on your property taxes. Now, I need to know, show of hands, you don't have to raise them very high and the camera's not going to catch it. How many of you have a homestead exemption on your property right now? Okay. How many of you do not have a homestead exemption? Okay, or or you're I not sure. Tell. You can't I, tell. I mailed it in because the site is down. I was like, this is the most inopportune moment to have the site down. Well, like, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna help you tonight. Okay. We'll, we'll, in, we'll 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 get we'll get there. Okay? okay. But that's one of the jobs that we do is we provide homestead exemptions and we provide the application process. Now there's a bunch of applications back there that if you already have a homestead exemption. You don't need to, you can keep the exemption, but you don't need to fill out a new exemption form. Okay. You already have it. You, you can, you can get it. Now, let me tell you how you, you can know if you have a homestead exemption in, in, at the appraisal district. Go to our website, www.tad.org, Parent Appraisal District, or TAD for short, TAD, and our, it's .org. Okay. You go to our website. There's a search area where you can put your last name in. It's best if you could put your account number in because there's only one account number. Uh, if your last name is Jones, there's a lot of Jones. If your last name is Smith, there's a lot of Smiths. But there's only one account number. Okay? So search for your account number or search for your address. And once you find your account, you click on your account number and it'll take you to the details of your particular account. Scroll to the very bottom of that, and down at the bottom, there will be a bar that says exemptions. Now, there's multiple exemptions that we offer. That It's not just we. The state of Texas offers. The first type of exemption is a homestead exemption. This is, this is uh, applicable to anyone who owns a home in the state of Texas and occupies that home as your principal place of residence. You remember when Shauna said, you can have a home buyer assistance, but it's only on one home. That's the same thing with exemptions. It's only on one home. It's the home that you live in principally. Okay. Your primary residence. If you just scroll to the bottom down there, it'll tell you if you have a homestead exemption. Now, another exemption that's very common that we, we administer is 60, the year uh, age 65 and older exemptions. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise your hand to admit whether or not they're 65 or older. Okay. But if you're 65 years of age and older, you can have a homestead exemption, but you can also apply for, a, for an elderly exemption, a 65 and older exemption. You can both. But you can't go to my website and scroll to the bottom and see if you have your over 65. The reason there that is, is there's a law that says I can't put anything on the Internet that tells anyone what your age is. Now, everybody can have a homestead, so I can put that on the internet, but I can't put the 65 and older, okay? So in that case, you'd have to call us to see if you have the 65 and older. Another way you could do it is how many of you remember receiving the blue, the blue appraisal notice that we send out every April? Okay, all of your exemptions are listed on that blue document. If you still have that blue document from 2022, you can go look at that document down towards the bottom third of that. It'll list your exemption. And that one will actually say, yes, you have a homestead. And yes, you have a 65 and older. Or you have a disabled person. Or you have a disabled veteran. So on and so forth. It will list all your exemptions on that. Because that's coming directly to you privately. Okay. So I've mentioned homesteads. And I've mentioned 65 and older. Another exemption that we offer is a disabled person's exemption. Now, if you're age 65 and older and you're also disabled, you have to choose between the two. Okay? You can't have both. They basically do the exact same thing. But some people are become disabled and they're not yet 65. So if you're disabled and you're under 65, you can apply for a disability exemption. Uh, if you're 65 and then you become disabled, well, you probably have already applied for the over 65. There's no need to apply for the disability exemption. If you're disabled and you're, say, 55, and then when you turn 65, there's really no need for you to apply for the 65 and older exemption because you already have the disabled, which is pretty much the same exact benefit as the 65 and older. But I would call in and check to see if there's any benefits that any benefits that you would have by applying for the 65 and older. And we'll help you step through that process. And we, I would advise you like I would advise my own mom and dad. 
I would look at everything and say, you know what, you're better off just sticking with the disabled person and not resetting to the 65. Or I would do all the calculations and say, no, you would be better off reapplying. Okay, so we'll help you with that. So that's the other one we have. <clears throat> if you have, if you're a veteran and you're disabled, there's your veteran. No. Oh, question. But you're dis disabled. What? Can you lose your disability? Uh, if you're a parent, I won't take it away from you. But what what determines if you're disabled or not is if you're receiving Social Security benefits from the Social Security Administration. What, if you apply for a disability exemption, you fill out the paperwork and you bring it to us, you have to bring us the document from the Social Security Administration showing that you're disabled. We don't make a determination if you're disabled or not. Someone else makes that determination. And it's basically if you're receiving Social Security uh, disability benefits from Social Security. Same thing if you're a disabled veteran. We don't make that decision if that you're disabled. We require you to bring in paperwork from the Veterans Administration where the VA has said you're disabled and they, there's a document that they say you're 10%, you're 20%, 50%, 100% disabled. And so we get that document is what tells us if you're disabled or not. So we, we administer it, but someone else is making the determination if you're disabled or not. Either the Social Security office is or the Veterans Administration is. So if you are a disabled veteran, uh, and it can be that you're, you were a veteran in the service and you, you weren't disabled at the time, but you've come out later on and then you became disabled and the, and the Veterans Administration says you're disabled, you can get another exemption. So it's possible you can have a homestead, a 65 and older disability, or a 65 and older exemption and a disabled veteran exemption. Okay, those all three will save, can save you money. Now, there are some other benefits. If you are a spouse, uh, a surviving spouse of a person that was killed in action, there's some other bit, uh, killed in action as in the, uh, well, it's now several things. You can be uh, killed in action as a police officer or killed in action as a military uh, service personnel. But if you're a surviving spouse of someone that has, has died as a result of that, there's some other benefits that you can get there too from uh, an exemption standpoint. If you are a uh, military veteran that during your time you were listed as a 100% disabled military veteran, there is some exemption you can get from that standpoint too. And if you fall in any of those veteran type disabilities, you know, you can talk to me afterwards and I, we can kind of drill down a little bit more to see whether or not you might be eligible. But again, all of the eligibility is going to come from the VA. The VA will be the one that tells us what your disability rating is, and then we'll apply uh, an advisor on what you can apply for to be eligible for that. Yes, ma'am? If you've already paid your taxes, does it, would it be my advantage to apply for this? Absolutely. Great question. She says, if I've already paid my taxes, would it be to my advantage to, to do this? Yes, because the legislature, the law says, that you can actually go back two years. So if you if you own your house, and this is the first almost of 2023, you lived there on the house on January 1st of 2022, and you lived in there on 2021, January 1st, we can actually, you can apply today in 2023, and we can go back two years. And if you, if you do a refund, we will process it. We'll uh, submit the paperwork to the Tarrant County Tax Office, and they'll send you a refund for those prior two years. So yes, it is it is beneficial for you to come in and do that if you haven't done so. Again, check check those exemptions uh, when we go back. But two years is as far back as we can go. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Um, when I'm disabled and I'm found for life, and I'm homestead, show that they don't pay work. But when I'm in sixty-five, the tax office changed my status from disabled to over 65. Okay. And I was not notified. Okay. They did that. All of a sudden, I did this in the middle of the morning. Well, there actually is a, there's another law. You know, I said that we're governed by the property tax code. These laws that I'm referring to is the property tax code. There is a law that says that when you apply for a homestead exemption, when you're under the age of 65, and if you put your birth date on that form, when your birthday comes around, we look at that and say, here's an individual that now qual may qualify for the 65 and older. We'll look to see if we 
we can verify that you're still eligible for that. And if you are, we'll automatically grant the over 65 for you. So you don't have to reapply. Now, if you don't provide your birthday on that form, then we won't, we won't automatically, we won't know otherwise when you turn 65. But we'll say for the 65 and older, um, it doesn't matter when you turn 65. If you turn 65 on December the 31st of 2022, you're eligible for the over 65 exemption for the whole year of 2022. So whenever your birth date is, that's the day you need to come in and apply and make sure you have the 65 and older uh, exemption in place in addition to the homestead. Okay. Let me see here. Um, we, I, I want to spend a lot of time exemption. Right? Some of the other things that we do is we maintain ownership records. Uh, we want to make sure that we have your right address. We want to make sure that we have the ownership to the property correct. Uh, because that's that's how Mrs. Burgess, uh, Miss Burgess, I should say, uh, that's how she's going to send the tax bill to you, is the address that we sent her, and she'll use that to, to mail out everything. So we have, uh, we, have we, we do many different types of appraisals. Mostly what we do is residential appraisals. But we also do commercial appraisals, like buildings like this. Uh, buildings like downtown Fort Worth and things of that nature, retail. Uh, but we also do business personal property appraisals, and then we have mineral appraisals that we also perform. A lot of appraisal activities we were responsible for. Actually, we have over 1.8 million separate accounts that we have to appraise in Tarrant County every year. So it's a big task. It's a big job. I think we do a really, really good job of getting it right, but we don't always get it right. And so that's the process that will come up next. Let me see what the next slide is. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. There's a handout for this. You may or may not have picked it up. I know it's not very good, easy to see on the screen, but you do have a, a handout that you can look at. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Matthew, tell you how to do your job. And but some figures would be nice. Like you keep saying exemption and everybody wants to oh. So, you know. Some numbers, right? Okay, that's actually that's actually a really good point. And uh, I've been doing this job for a long time, so I, I kind of know in my head what it is. So let, let's start. It's a really, really good point. You all you all live in the city of Fort Worth, right? You're all in Fort Worth Independent School District, right? Maybe a different school district. Fort Worth. You all live in Tarrant County. You all live in Fort Worth ISD. And you all live in the city, city of Fort Worth. Let's go with those. Tarrant County at this particular time does not give any exemptions for a regular homestead. I'm going to, I'm going to reveal my age. Okay. I'm 56 years old, so I'm not eligible for the 65 and older exemption and I'm not disabled. So I'm not eligible for that. So the only thing I'm eligible for is the homestead exemption. Tarrant County doesn't give a homestead exemption. They're not required to the city of Fort Worth. On the other hand, they give a 20% homestead exemption. So if I have a house that's worth $200,000, let's say, 20% is going to be a $40,000 exemption. Okay. And what it, what it basically does is my house is worth $200,000. The city of Fort Worth, when they calculate my taxes, they're going to take 200,000 minus 40,000. And they're only going to tax me on a value of $160,000. So it does, it does save quite a bit. And you can generally factor in that the city of Fort Worth's property tax rate is around three quarters of 1%. So $40,000 and 1% would be about $400. Three quarters of that would be about $370, something like that. So you're going to, for the city of Fort Worth, you're going to save about $370. You might check my math. I, I have a rule. Don't do math in public. I'll be wrong or get, or pull out my calculator. And I didn't do that. So but you're going to have 350 to $375 worth of savings for the city. The school, on the other hand, which is our largest amount of tax that we pay, the state law says that every school in the state of Texas has to give a $40,000 exemption. Now, school tax rates are a lot higher than the city tax rate. Tax, the city taxes you on about $0.75 cents for every $100 of value, or 0.75%. Schools, on the other hand, have about a $1.25 tax rate, or 1.25%. So your savings for your school taxes for a homestead of $40,000, 
that's actually going to probably wind up being again be careful don't do math in public 500 to 600 dollars in savings so between the city and the, the the school tax you're saving close to a thousand bucks by having the homestead exemption i will tell you some more kind of good news i, I think it's coming uh recently the lieutenant governor dan patrick uh, when he was sworn in he gave a speech and in part of his speech, he said he plans on passing and the, the, the state representative, the, the, the Texas legislature, upping our homestead exemption for schools from 40,000. He wants to take it to 70,000, which would be good, which would be really good. Um, I heard at one point in time, Governor Abbott was saying he wanted to take it to 100,000. That would be really good. The problem with these two bills, the problem with these two ideas is that for school districts, the state will have to figure out how to make that money up for our school system. If we, if we get, if I get everybody a hundred thousand dollar exemption for your school tax, that means less revenue is going to go to the schools. The question then becomes, how is the school going to operate when we cut that revenue? That, and that's where they're talking about doing is with a surplus that they have. And and I, again, I'm not a I'm I'm not doing a political speech or anything like that. I'm just saying. That I think it would be great if they lower if they raised it from 40 to 70. I think it'd be even better if it went from 40 to 100. How they offset that revenue loss, that's something for them to figure out. And that's one of the things that they'll be working on. So I, I think that's kind of some interesting news. I wouldn't uh, don't go don't go to spend that money yet. <laughs> let's let them pass the law first and let them let's let them uh, see how we're going to administer that. But it's possible that you could see some some property tax relief coming after this session and the legislature won't complete its work until June towards the end of June that's when and then most of these laws don't go into effect until September so just we just hold on to that uh, money don't you don't go spend it just just right now okay but the, I was I was talking about appraisals for you before you asked that question a very very good question but we, we do a lot of appraisal work 1.8 million appraisals we get them we get a lot right we get some wrong when we send you out that blue notice, when we're doing all of our appraisal work between January the 1st and May 15th, the next phase we go into is what we call the equalization phase. And that's the time in which we'll send you that blue notice in the, in the mail and say, hey, we think your house is worth this. Last year, we thought your house was worth $150,000. This year, we think your house is worth $175,000. But how do we come up with that? We come up with that based upon sales information. We look at properties and what, what they're selling for then, and then we look at properties and say, what are they selling for now? And we subscribe to a whole lot of different sources that help us with that information. And if, and if the data supports it, we will raise the value. Now, we anticipate values going up because the real estate market has been on a, a sharp incline over the last four or five years. Uh, and, and so we're expecting them to continue to rise. But if you feel like we're wrong on our value, you have the right to file a protest. You have the right to challenge that. And you can do it through either an informal process or maybe you come to our office and you speak with somebody. You could call us on the telephone possibly and speak with somebody. You can go online possibly and, and file, a, file a protest if you like. We have been redoing our website. Uh, it's not down. Uh, it, it may look like it's down. I but it's, so. I can't log in. I'm frustrated. <laughs> no, the, actually the login part uh, has been taken down. But we're bringing it back. Okay. We're, what we're doing with our website basically is Tad's website for years and years and years has been a website where we just offered up information, public information. It's like, here's this information. If you want to look at it, you're welcome to. The legislature has changed over time and said, well, you know what? You need to offer an online protest feature. Okay. So we did that. You need to offer an online settlement negotiation process. Okay, you need to also allow for people to apply for like homestead exemptions and applications online. Our website has trans transitioned from a regular static. Here's some information. If you want to look at it, you can. To now we have almost like an e-commerce system to where you're saying, hey, I want to apply for something. And if you want to apply for a homestead exemption, one of the first things we're going to ask is let's see a copy of your driver's license. Because the law says that the address on your driver's license has to match the address that you're applying for an exemption on. So if you're going to do that online, you've got to upload a picture of your driver's license to me. If you're going to protest, you may upload photos to me. If you're, if you're protesting, you may upload sales information. 
we came back and said, you know what, we need to put the brakes on a little bit and we need to make sure everything that we're collecting is secure. That security is a top priority. So we, we have taken some features down on our website just for the purposes of making sure that the data we're collecting is safe and secure. So we're, we're working through that, we're processing that, and we're looking to get that back up and running as quickly as we can. But safety and security is, is paramount. We want to do that first. It's just our website, our, our, our responsibilities have changed from just here's some public information to now send me everything about yourself. <laughs> but I got to hold on to that. I got to keep it secure. So that's why we're in transition. Yes, ma'am. What is the settlement process? Ask me that's what. <coughs> What is the settlement process? The settlement process. Okay. That would be the process in which when we send you that blue notice and we say oh, we've raised your value from 150 to 175 and you think that's too much, you think you're, you, don't, you couldn't sell your property for that, you'll, you'll engage us in kind of an informal process where you say, hey, I think that's too high. We'll say, okay, well, here's the, some information that we have pertaining to your property. We probably will provide you with some sales information in your neighborhood. And we, you know, we'll we'll look at it and say, well, here's one that sold for 160, here's one that sold for 180, here's one that sold for 200, but here's one that did sell for 150. And through the process of appraisal, we'll look back and say, based upon this information, that's how that's why we think your property might sell for 175. You may come in and say, Well, hey, my neighbor right next door just sold one house for 140. Or did you know my house has a cracked slab? Did you know my house has foundation problems? Shauna mentioned about a program for weatherization and roof repairs and things like that may be available to homeowners in Fort Worth under certain eligibility requirements, but maybe your house does need a new roof. Maybe that's something we didn't know about. Maybe we don't know about uh, water damage that was from the freeze that maybe hasn't been repaired, things like that. So if you share some of that information, we may come back saying, you know, I think you're right. Maybe your, maybe your house is still only worth 150. Once we agree to that, that's the settlement process. That's us coming back and, and agreeing upon a value. We may provide information that says, you know, I don't think it's worth 175, but I think it's worth 165. And you come back and say, you know, based upon what you've shared with me, I agree it's not worth 175, but I, I would agree it's worth 165. And then when we agree, we settle that protest issue, and there's some paperwork that we that we have uh, to initiate that settlement. So that that's basically the settlement process. Okay, let's see here. What's and I'll go through this. Oh, we got one back here. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me. Can you take your mask off and ask that question? Yeah. Okay. No, there is not. That's another very good question. You're only allowed your homestead exemption on your primary residence. And you can only have one primary residence. And again, state law says that your driver's license address has to be that primary residence. So you can't have two addresses on a driver's license, right? So if you own, if you own a home and then you own a rent house, you can apply for the homestead exemption on the house that you live in, that you reside in. Now, if you are a disabled veteran, Technically, the disabled veteran exemption doesn't really pertain to a homestead. You can actually put that exemption on a rent house. You can have your homestead on the on your home that you live in, and you can have your disabled veteran exemption on the on a rent house. So, but no, you can only have one homestead. <clears throat> so back to this quick calendar. We appraise, we do this settlement process in this equalization phase. In this assessment phase, this is where your the appraisal district does this part here. The appraisal and the equalization. This assessment phase is actually done by your elected officials. This is the time in which they are working on their budgets and they're setting tax rates. That's your school boards, that's your uh, city councils, that's your county commissioners. And then this collection phase is where Miss Wendy Burgess gets involved and she takes the tax rates that are set by your elected officials applies them to the values that we came up with and mails tax bills out. And then she starts collecting property taxes in this collection phase here. We don't really want to get to the delinquent phase, right? Because we all want to pay our property taxes on time so we don't incur penalties and interest. But sometimes people get over here and Miss Burgess has to go through collecting the delinquent taxes. But that's a really good a calendar there if you want to kind of hold on to it. Go ahead and go to the next one. 
I'll wrap up pretty quickly. We're located at uh, 2500 Hanley Eaterville Road. Or if you know where the, we're over in kind of the northeast part of Tarrant County, close to Northeast Mall, uh, right there at where 121 and 820 kind of come together. That's where we're located. Go ahead. Uh, we're open Monday through Fridays. Uh, the community role I've kind of already talked about. But we can go, this is where there's 73 different taxing entities in Tarrant County. There's one county, but there's about 26 or 27 cities. There's about uh, 18 to 20 school districts. There's a hospital district. There's a junior college district. There's a Tarrant Regional Water District. There are some municipal utility districts in Tarrant County. So out of, and all of those different entities can levy a tax against property. Now, where you live determines which ones are levied against you. You have Tarrant County. You have Tarrant County Hospital. You have uh, the Tarrant County Junior College. You may or may not have the Tarrant Regional Water District. You may or may not, you have the City of Fort Worth. You have Fort Worth ISD. I think those are the entities that most likely you you have to pay taxes to. Um, but other other folks may pay to Keller City, Keller ISD, things of that nature, depending on where they live. But there's 73, and they are the ones who handle the actual tax rate, which value is an important part of property taxes. But the tax rate is more important okay? because what your house is worth is, is just that. It's what someone would be willing to pay you for your home. And I've never met anyone yet, you know, that, that hopes their value really, you know, hopes their home loses value. They want to see it's your it's most likely your biggest investment, right? It's the thing that you've probably spent the most money money on. So you want it to continue to grow in value. But the tax rate. Is something that's set by the local elected officials to generate revenue. And when that tax rate's applied to your value, that's that's what determines how much tax. So yeah, you, we need to make sure the value is right, but you also need to make sure and hold your elected officials accountable too to make sure they're not setting tax rates too high. If I raise taxes value by 20%, they probably should in turn lower taxes, tax rates a certain amount, right? Otherwise, if they keep the tax rates the same and I, I raise value by 20%, you just got a 20% increase in your tax. So there, there, it, it's up and down. If I raise value, there should be, it's kind of like a seesaw. If values go up, tax rates should go down. Uh, if tax rates go up, that should be a result because values have gone down. Well, values haven't gone down in the last several, several years. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, these are just some awards that we we the Tarrant Appraisal District run. We've been voted best place, one of the best places to work for 2021 and 2022. Uh, we've also received some other uh, good achievement awards from some some industry recognition. Basically, go to the next slide. Uh, I want I want to throw a plug out right here. When when you come in to uh, protest your value, if we can't reach that settlement, okay. If I think the property is worth 175 and I've got information that just says that that's what it's worth and you still think it's worth 150 or 140 and we can't reach that settlement, you can go before the appraisal review board. The appraisal review board is a board that's made up of citizens just like you all. And what their job to do is their job is to hear my evidence and their job is to hear your evidence. And I tell people all the time, this is what they're going to do one of three things. They're going to agree with me. And they're going to set your value at what I think it's worth. Or they're going to disagree with me and they're going to agree with you and they're going to set your value at what you think it's worth. Or they're going to disagree with both of us. They're going to say, I'm too high. And they're going to say, you're too low. And they're going to put the value somewhere in between. That's what their job is, is to try to hear disputes, look at evidence and make a decision. They're kind of like a jury. Okay. You know, again, you think it's worth 100. I think it's worth 200. They're going to weigh all the evidence and they're going to either set it here. They're going to set it here. Or they're going to come somewhere in between. They might sometimes be a little closer to me. They might sometimes be a little closer to you. They may sometimes agree with you. They may sometimes agree with me. But it's all it's all supposed to be based on the evidence. Now, one thing I would like to put out there is if you are an individual that's retired, uh, the appraisal review board is looking for volunteers, basically. Uh, the appraisal district doesn't do anything with regards to the appointment of a, uh, ARB members, appraisal review board members. There's a local administrative district judge that appoints them. Now, they, they do get paid, though, for what they do. The law says that I am to uh, pay them a daily per diem. 
So when they show up to work, if they work a half a day, they get a half day per diem. If they work a full day, they get a full day per diem. And I think that the number was about $170 a day, but we've raised it recently. But I don't, do y'all remember what we raised it to? Okay, it, it's gone up from the 170, but I can't remember right off the top of my head what it is. But if that's something that you're interested in, uh, I would recommend you go to our website, get an application, fill it out, and we'll get that information to the local administrative judge. Uh, and quite frankly, we're looking for people uh, all throughout Tarrant County. Uh, right now, we're, we're a little heavy, I would say, on uh, proper people that are out of the kind of the northeast part of Tarrant County. And we need more people geographically located all throughout the county. So I want to put that out there. If it's something that you might be interested in, uh, call our office, call the ARB, uh, look on our website. We, we do have applications out there that you can uh, fill out. Uh, it's basically a, a kind of part-time work, if you will, but it is kind of intensive through the summer. We're, when we send out, when you look at that calendar, we sent out appraisal notices in April, protest deadline shows up in May, and then for May, June, July, into August, there's a lot of work that has to be done. And uh, so I just want to throw that out there if it's something, if you, if you work a full-time job, you know, I can't be an ARB member because I'm, I'm too busy working. But uh, we have a lot of retired folks that uh, will take this on. It's kind of a community service thing, kind of giving back to the community. But you are being reimbursed for, for some of your time. Okay? Uh, is there any more slides? Nope, there are no more slides. I want to thank you for uh, being here today. Is there any questions that have not been asked that you would like to ask? Yes. Yes, that's another great question. His question was, is you got a husband and wife and uh, both names are on the property and the husband turns 65. Can the husband apply? And the answer is yes, you can. Yeah, just one of you need to. Uh, since you are since you are a married couple, when, when the husband or the wife, whoever is eligible at 65, the exemption applies to the whole property. Oh, yes. No, no. If it's if it's just in one name, yes, then only that person can apply. So like like in my case, my, me and my wife are both on the deed. So it doesn't matter whether she applies for the exemption or I apply for the exemption. We both get the exemption. Now, I will tell you this, that uh, and we have had this situation. Let's say let's say a um, two best friends go and buy a house together. Doesn't matter whether it's two guys, two girls, or a guy and a girl. It doesn't matter. They're not married. If they come in and apply and their names are on the deed as Bob Smith and Tom Jones, they each would have to apply. And one person would get half of the exemption. The other person would get the other half of the exemption. But in the case there, if, say, one was 65 and older, they'd only get a 65 and older on half of the property. But when you're married, we treat you as... a uh, one one individual and there are some other benefits too that let's say let's say you're married and it doesn't matter who but one of you is 65 and you come in and apply for the benefit and later on a year or two later that person passes away if you are over the if you are 55 years of age or older you get what's called a 55 surviving spouse benefit and you get to keep the over 65 exemption when the other person passes away. Kind of same thing happens with some of the disabled uh, exemptions. If you're married and, and, the, and the person passes away, you can, you can kind of retain the others, a, what's called a surviving spouse benefit. But if you remarry, you may lose that benefit um, unless, unless you're 65. So there are some benefits there. The legislature has been real kind as far as allowing those benefits to remain in place. Now I will tell you this, if, if you're turning 65 now or, or you just turned 65 or you've been 65 for a few years and you decide that you want to uh, add, a, add on to your home, the que another question that should be asked is, well, once, once I turn 65, one of the best benefits is that's something called a tax ceiling, which basically means that the year in which you turn 65, we'll calculate what your school tax, your city tax, your county tax is, and some of these others. 
And whatever it calculates at, that's the most you'll ever pay. It's called a ceiling. You'll never pay more than that ceiling. Except if you come and add to your property. Let's say you always wanted that swimming pool. And so now you're, you're 68 and you decide to put the swimming pool in. We will change your tax ceiling based upon the value of the swimming pool. If you decide to add the sunroom, if you decide to add a, a, an additional bathroom, we will add the value that's been added. Now, if you decide that uh, we need a new roof and the city of Fort Worth comes out and puts on a new roof for you, we're not going to add, you're not going to increase your ceiling because you replaced the roof or you repainted or you put new carpet in or you replaced a water heater or an air conditioner or something like that. You had an air conditioner, now you have an air conditioner. That's not new, the way I interpret it, okay? But you didn't have a swimming pool, now you have a swimming pool, that's new. You had a three-bedroom house with one bath, and now you have a three-bedroom house with two baths, you, you had a new bath, so that, that's new. So we will add that. Yes, sir? Let's say you went through the exemption process and got a, it reduced one year. You come back the next year, can you use those same criteria that you used that year for the reduction, like it may have further deteriorated? Uh, yes, um, you, you can, uh, as far as dealing with the value. Now, let's let's be careful that we don't that we don't mix an exemption with what something's worth. Okay, because if something has further deteriorated, that may affect your value. Right. But if you're 65 years of age and older and you you've got a ceiling set on your taxes and your value keeps going up and up and up and up and up and up and up i i tell i told my mom when my mom and dad turned 65 i said once you get this 65 exemption i said don't ever protest your property value again let it go as high as it wants to go your taxes are set here because there's another provision in the law that says Let's say, and I'm just going to make up a scenario. Let's say you and you and your, your spouse are living together and you have this home and, and you have the over 65, one of you, and five years down the road, uh, one of you passes away. And the, and the surviving person decides, you know what? I think I'm going to uh, sell the house and I'm going to move to San Antonio and uh, live closer to my daughter or my son. I'm going to, I'm going to move closer to family. There's a provision where we can come in and say, okay, What's the percentage of savings that you were receiving on this house here? You can transfer that percentage of savings to the next house down in San Antonio for school tax purposes. And, and the benefit is, is that if, if this value goes up and up and up and up and up, the percentage of savings gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I've actually seen people come in and they want to argue with us and they want to beat the value back because they always, they've been programmed in with, we got to protest, got to protest, got to protest. And I tell them, I'm like, look, if, if you'll if you'll just let the value do what the value is going to do, and then if you decide to, which we call it prorate, it's a proration, you actually will have a bigger benefit coming your way if you just don't protest. Now, I know that sounds at odds. It sounds opposite of what you see on Channel 5. <laughs> That's not what they tell you about. But I'm telling you, because I've done the calculations, when you turn 65 and you get that tax ceiling set, you don't need to worry about your value anymore. Now, I will tell you this. For people who uh, have the hospital tax and the Tarrant Regional Water tax, they're not allowed to offer by law a ceiling. They're, that tax can continue to go up. But I'll tell you, that tax is relatively small compared to everything else. Charlie Guerin, how many of you know Ch Representative Charlie Guerin? He's actually introduced a bill this year, this session, that would require all taxing units to honor a ceiling. So therefore, and I hope it passes because it'll allow the, the hospital district and the Tarrant Regional Water District to have to establish a ceiling. Then when you turn 65 and you don't add the swimming pool or a, a deck or something like that, your taxes will never increase. And if your taxes never increase, you don't have to worry about what the value does. But yes, you can come in and argue that, hey, my value is too high. I think it needs to come down. If I've got a tax ceiling over here, if it was me, I, I, I'd go back to watch the football game. I'd go back to watch the football game. I was pretty much referencing uh, rental property. Now, rental property is completely different. Yeah, you can come in and argue every year that, hey, I think my value's gone down. Just bring the evidence. One thing I suggest you never come into the appraisal review board is don't come in and say my taxes are too high. 
You're not here to protest taxes. You're here to protest the value. The appraisal district doesn't have anything to do with taxes. All we have anything to do with is value. And when you come in and you tell, hey, well, I think my taxes are too high, the, the advice you may get was you need to go talk to your elected officials because they're the ones that set the tax rates and determine how much tax you have to pay. But if you come into us, you're here to protest value. And here's some photographs. Here's some uh, estimates of repairs. Here's some evidence that would suggest that the value we have is, is not correct. And again, I'm not going to tell you that we're, we're right all the time because I have 1.8 million pieces of property to appraise every year. I don't know everything about your property. You know more about your property than I do. You know more about the repairs that it needs. I, I get to drive by and look at your house. I have no lawful authorization to come on your property. I can come up and knock on your door and say, hey, we're here. Can we remeasure certain parts of it? And if you say no, get off my property, I'll probably tell you that's perfectly fine. I'll, I'll estimate from the street. I can do that. But I can't come in your house. I have no, I have no authority whatsoever to come inside your home and look around. Quite frankly, I don't want to because if I can come inside your home and see all the interior, but I don't get to come into her home and I don't get to come into his home, it doesn't really make it fair for you and it doesn't make it fair for them. So we, we try to be uniform in how we do our appraisals. So we don't typically come at people's homes. Now people will bring us photographs and say, look at the, what the foundation has done to the walls and the cracks and everything like that. We will take that kind of stuff into consideration, which we may not know. We may not know anything about. So I can just go on and on and on, but I won't. Any, anybody else, any final questions before I wrap up? Well, we thank you for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you. This is uh, the second one we've done, and we have four more, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you all for your attention.